Hello. <coughs> My name is Robert Morgan and this is month five of a series on game stories, how they work, why they often don't work, and how they are like and unlike other literatures. The aim of these talks is to begin finding some sort of technical vocabulary to talk about some of the things that happen in game stories because there's a technical vocabulary of these things that happen in literature. I studied literature at university. I'm supposed to know what these mean. And yes, they are as boring and as difficult to remember as they look. Now, we have some of these terms in games, but they mostly take the form of cliches. If you spend as much time on TV tropes as I do, then you'll know that it's relatively easy to make jokes or comments or generalizations about things that we see happening in games all the time. But most of these are about the things that happen in the game, not how it works. And so it's a bit different to having a palette of technical terms, because that allows us to kind of to talk about games without constantly telling people what games they have to play in order to understand. It allows you to say, you don't have to t play this game because I can tell you what's happening in it, rather than, oh, this is just like, right, this is the, a companion cube moment, even if th that names the concept that you're trying to come up with. Hopefully, people won't have to play that game in order to understand what you're talking about. And that kind of technical palette of terms means that in literature we can simply, we can like, we can make generalizations. Rather than just saying like Tom Stoppard is, is, he's kind of smug, we can say Tom Stoppard enjoys using metafiction and fourth wall breaking techniques to make the audience feel almost, but not quite as clever as him. Well, sort of as clever as him. In the same ballpark anyway, a bit clever, cleverer than average, but not as clever as Tom Stoppard, let's face it. Now, <laughs> Once you have a set of these terms, we've talked a lot about this technical vocabulary. So these are from literature, because that's what I had the most formal training in. But what we're going to be talking about today is actually, it comes up more often as a term in film theory. Now, Jake chided me last time for overrunning, so let's get down to business. <laughs> Chapter five, diegesis. So what is this? It comes up in Greek literary criticism, and it comes up a bit in modern literary criticism, but it's most commonly used in film theory. And the best example of how it's used there is in music. So diegetic music is the term we use for music that belongs in the world of the film. If you can see the instruments, if you can see where the music is coming from, then it's diegetic music. If you, raindrops keep falling on my head? Anybody? Butch and Sundance? No? One, one or two, okay, yeah, good. If you can't see where the music is coming from, if it's part of the soundtrack, then it's non-diegetic music. So musicals in general, and Mulan in particular, are quite good examples of this. Where the hell is the music coming from? They're usually singing, or they start singing at least, but Shang's song starts off with him singing, and then suddenly it's covering a montage and he is definitely not singing because he has no sense of humor. <laughs> but we've forgiven. <clears throat> Where was I? <laughs> Diegesis. So un where did this word come from? Unsurprisingly, it's bloody Greek. And it actually means telling or narrating in the Greek. And in ancient lit crit, it's usually contrasted. Uh, what happened there? Oh. Uh, it's all going down. So I, I think you just knocked it. Any better? Hey. hey. All right. So it's usually contrasted in the in Greek literary criticism with something we've already talked about, mimesis. This is way back in chapter two. So mimesis, we talked about as kind of the imitation, the act, the performance, the representation of what the story is supposed to be about. What happens on the stage? So diegesis is the narration. It's like the voiceover. It's what's telling us what's happening. It's what's going on if someone is telling you rather than showing you. But this is kind of slippery then, because if diegesis is like the narrator, then how can we talk about diegetic music in terms of what's like inside the film? Because remember, if you can see where the music is coming from, then it's diegetic. So it's slightly confusing, but it happens because to a film theorist, film is about narration. All of film is about narration. Not just the voiceover, which is just as well because voiceovers have perpetrated some of the worst cinematic crimes in history, original cut of Blade Runner, I'm looking at you. It's because in film theory, the camera is the narrator. The camera is the storyteller. The camera is the person who's sitting and telling you the whole thing. Because when a filmmaker shows us a scene, they control entirely, almost entirely, what we're looking at. They can cut to something else. They can curate and present a curated, created form of the world. 
So next time there's, that you watch a film and there's a cut in the action and the, the guy, the, the filmmakers choose to move us from one scene to another, just imagine, just imagine a director creepily whispering in your ear, meanwhile on the other side of the forest. Yeah. And it gets worse. Imagine them creepily whispering it in your ear up to a hundred times a minute. Ugh. Every time there's a cut. This is my attempt to give him one of the creepy mouths from, one of the, new, from the new Turtles film. And yeah, it doesn't, it don't look right. And of course, remember, it's actually the film editor whispering in your ear. Usually not the director making the choices about when to say, I'm going to cut here, meanwhile on the other side of the forest which is probably much more palatable to imagine an editor in most cases. There's a reason these guys won the 1977 Oscar for film editing for Star Wars. It's because they saved that film, because it saved it from being a laughable footnote to, to sci-fi, basically. Because remember, if George Lucas had had his way, then Jabba the Hutt would have looked like this. <laughs> so this is why we talk about this idea of the diegetic world of the film. That's the world of the fiction. And things which sit outside it, like the soundtrack, are outside the world that the filmmaker builds and tells us about. But it, so if diegesis kind of means these really different things in literary criticism, and they mean something slightly different in film criticism, where does that leave games? Well, for me, I think that means that the term is kind of ripe for us to use and to take over and to use it to describe something that's useful to us. Because remember, in most cases, if games have a narrator, if they have a telling voice, then it's actually us, it's the player. Because the game maker has constructed a world for us, but then we tell our own narrative by choosing what to look at and where to look. So it's kind of a mix of the two. Now, this isn't as simple as just talking about breaking the fourth wall, which games certainly do all the time. We're probably all familiar with that term, but remember, it comes from theater, and it's, be it's because traditionally theater takes place inside a box. So it has three walls and an imaginary fourth wall, which is actually a window that the audience looks through. And a trained actor, theoretically, is supposed to act as though that wall really is another real wall. It's another inside wall of the living room where the murder has taken place or whatever. Except it never actually works like that because actors are also trained to always do everything in that direction. And it would be creepy as hell to watch people in a real room always positioning themselves so that they can be seen to one wall. But we still use this term in cinema when there aren't any walls at all. And that's because in most media, the fourth wall isn't just the barrier between the fictional world and the non-fictional world. It's actually the barrier between what the audience can control and what they can't control, what's happening on screen. The audience can get up, they can walk around, they can go to the loo, but if they can get on stage, that's when you know something's gone wrong. And when a film pretends for most of the time that it's not aware that we are watching and then suddenly it becomes aware that we're watching and turns to the camera, it's trying to invert this effect. It's trying to make us feel like we didn't just watch, we were being watched as well. And that's really relevant for games because in games we're already inside the fourth wall. We extend into the fiction and we fictionalize as we act, as we play. Play is literally making stuff up from a set of starting points. We're inside the box, or we're partially inside the box. And what brought this home? Well, I've been playing a lot of Doom a lot, the new one. And I think it's interesting and quite telling that the story of the original game was effectively non-diegetic or extra-diegetic because it was in the manual. You didn't get pretty much any other story other than this. This was it. But I think it's very telling that the new Doom doesn't do this and has a diegetic story which exists inside the game. Now, you might argue that it's not that much story, and that's fine, know thine audience, because the game knows exactly how interested we are in its plot, which is not that much. What there is, is very well told. I thought it was quite good when we're not being locked into a room to kind of force us to pay attention to a cutscene, but never mind, it's reasonably well told. But it also literally doesn't matter if you go and make a cup of tea when it's trying to tell you the story. The game doesn't even pretend that you need to know what's going on in order to progress, and that's fine because it's that sort of game. You could miss the delivery of the story here, in fact, to the point where 
in order to get this cutscene, I had to like split second pause the LP that I was watching because he, he just drifts right past this. He doesn't even look at this, even though I think this is a masterful piece of storytelling. This is in the first 30 seconds of the game, and this is all the plot it gives you for like an hour. It's amazing. But there are times when storytelling in the game and mechanics in the game rely on diegesis. So there's a section fairly early on where the maps are pretty open, and you could work out where to go, but the game is trying to stop you from having to brute force it, having to trial and error try every single door, which I always end up doing anyway because I'm a completionist. It's trying to show you where to go, and it does this by spawning this holographic zombie when you activate a button. The zombie wanders out of one door and shuffles with zombie-like purpose across the room towards another door and goes through that one. And it shows you that that's your next objective. It shows you that this is an area of interest to you. Now, it's possible that I missed some detail or misinterpreted this. I mean, I'm literally a game writer. And, well, I, I didn't know any more about what was going on here than what it appeared to be. But what it appeared to be was also more significant because I knew that the game wasn't telling me this for no reason. I knew that if the game was going to show me a holographic zombie going somewhere, it was because I was supposed to pay attention to it. The fact that the game told me that, diegetically, I know that that makes it important. I know that that makes it an objective. Because games aren't very good at creating inconsequence. We know that this isn't a world of infinite possibility. We know it's not a world of coincidence because it's a created world and it's created for us. So if something attracts our attention, it's probably for a reason. In this sense, it's like literature. If you end up talking about a character's shoes or reading about a character's shoes, it's probably for a reason, unless you're reading Dan Brown. <laughs> but in a game, if you focus on a character's shoes, most of the time it's probably because you chose to. This is an example from a cutscene where our attention is drawn to the character's shoes. But in most cases, if you walk around a game and examine everybody's shoes, the game makers probably didn't plan for that, if they even bothered to model shoes or even feet in the first place. You can look at them though, you can focus on them if you want and decide for yourself how consequential or non-consequential they are. We understand that because we control it. Whereas if Star Wars contained 10 minutes of focus on Luke's shoes, we'd call it a bad movie. Seriously, you have these people to thank. <laughs> so let's dig into this. In mystery stories, if they're playing by the rules, you're supposed to be given every detail you need to solve the mystery yourself. And there are actually rule sets for these, because writing a mystery story is kind of like a game. If you're as smart as the detective, theoretically, the story should give you everything you need to know to work out the story beforehand. And so the art, the process of writing the mystery, is about seeding these clues through the story, but also making some of them look inconsequential, as we're told about them, making them red herrings, or giving us so many clues that we can't determine which ones are important and which ones aren't. But games aren't very good at inconsequence. Lack of consequence. And I think that's why part of why mystery and detective games so often fail as a simulation of actual detective work. They can be good games, but the closer they get to the world, the kind of arbitrary and capricious world of actual mystery solving, they often fall down because they're not good at inconsequence. I mean, imagine if you had to, you effectively do get an objective marker over many of these clues. If you're at a crime scene in a game and you just have to look at it as carefully as possible and hope you've got everything and the crime scene doesn't tell you if you miss a spot, we generally feel cheated in a game. There's a word for that and it's pixel hunt. And we usually use that to describe bad design. And this is because games Give us some opportunity to be wrong. Don't fucking drink it, Corvo, honestly. Don't touch anything that any of these people have been anywhere near. I don't care if it's a cutscene or not. Games give us ample opportunity to be wrong, but they rarely give us an opportunity to not matter or to be inconsequential. If I fail out of a driving sequence, which I do a lot, then it usually doesn't give me the opportunity to do a three-point turn and putter miserably back to the start or maybe just drive home and get a shame kebab on the way. It just cuts me to the point where I can get closer to succeeding again. Persona 4 is one of my favorite games and it's an interesting counter example of this. So mild spoilers, cover your ears if you are still planning to play the game. You can get to a point where there's effectively a false ending. It's possible to end the game prematurely, believing that you've solved the mystery, but actually there's a false ending. You can theoretically end the game thinking that you got it right and you didn't. 
And it's unsatisfying. It's anticlimactic. And the game is using the mechanic of anticlimax to inform you that that's happening. But it's also creating an unsatisfying situation in its own game and risking some players walking away thinking that it, you know, they hadn't, they'd forgotten to do the ending or they'd cut it off. We're expecting to know more, but it lets us have enough control. It lets us have control enough to fail and maybe even walk away unsatisfied. Seriously, just give me Persona 5, just take my money, come on. Now, in games, we actually do this all the time, though. We move between levels of diegesis. We move between levels of significance. We move between levels of control. Every time a cutscene starts, the game is consciously taking control away from us to show us what it thinks is important, which is why it sometimes ends up being frustrating, such as when I spend half an hour trying to get around the back of Sully to see his ass in this tuxedo. Come on, damn it! However, if you're playing an open world game and you start a story mission, you also know you're moving into an area of higher consequence. The level of your control hasn't changed, but if you step out of the open world and into a story mission, you suddenly know that everything you're being shown is of more consequence. Diegetically, you understand that things are more significant, whereas if you're in the open world, you're in an environment that was still created for you, but still the things that are happening in it are probably not meant to be story significant. Now, I've talked about this before, but just briefly, in Far Cry 3, there's a character called Buck. And in some ways, he's quite well done in that he is a very horrifying character to encounter. But he also raises some problems. So this is a character who presents a series of kind of B-plot missions, submissions off the main plot, because he's kidnapped a friend of yours and is holding him captive. Part of the problem with this character is that he's played for laughs, but he also represents a significant sexual threat. And what he's doing to your friend is implied to be really unpleasant. It tries to create a sense of urgency around you wanting to rescue your friend from this person. It's just that you have to do a series of missions for him. Once you finish one mission, he says, all right, you better get on with it then, meet me over here. But of course, it's an open world game. You can walk away and slay as many deer and craft as many wallets and do as many other missions as you want. And then you come back and the game pretends that you rushed from mission to mission. Once you start the cutscene, you arrive jogging and in a hurry because of course you want to rescue your friend. But it means that there's a dissonance because the game is telling us that we're switching between multiple levels of, not reality, but levels of significance, levels of diegetic meaning. It's all governed by this idea that we know not just where the fourth wall is, and where the fiction starts and where it stops, but that we can understand a whole gradation of realness and significance and diegesis all the way from us as the player through the menus, through the pause screens, through the upgrade system, into what's presented as a whole fiction that's complete. Sometimes the information presented to us is important and sometimes it's not. And games have developed this complex language of communicating this to us because games know that they only do part of the job. They leave the meaning making up to us, hopefully. Because remember, the diegetic world, the world of the story, is presented as complete. And for lack of a better world, it's presented as true. It's the extra diegetic elements that remind us that this is just one person or one team, one game maker's construction and curation and interpretation of reality. This is the stuff that reminds us that what we're seeing has been framed for us probably to tell us a specific thing, or to teach us a specific lesson, or create a specific impression. So when people talk about the idea of getting lost in a game, it's partly about this idea that if we can enter and act in a world which seems complete, which answers all the unanswered questions, can it start to feel enough like the real world? So much that we forget that this is a world that was made by someone for a purpose, possibly a political purpose, possibly to convince us of something, or make us feel a certain way. Because games can flip back and forth between in-fiction and out-of-fiction, between diegetic and extra-diegetic and meta-diegetic. And that means they can do new things. But in an era when our art form has to walk this tightrope over lazy critics who draw a direct line between having a computer game system in your house and violence, while still balancing a need and a right to make games, to make art that responds to society and says something about society around us, including the horrific violences that we do to each other. 
But I think that means we need to focus not on how real games are or on this idea of getting lost in the simulation or on this one barrier between what's real and what isn't, but on the idea that we can create fictional worlds that surprise you with sudden reality and real seeming worlds that surprise us with sudden fantasy. And on the idea that done right, games can show us a team or a game maker's vision of the way the world is, but also of the way the world should be. And more importantly, games can let us try out being not just who we want to be, but who we ought to be. That's where I want to leave it. Thank you very much. <laughs>